speaks the last word, and that speaks the best word. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's just praise Him. Hallelujah. We worship You, Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. You speak the better word. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. Thank You, Jesus. We honor, we glorify You, Lord, because of what You did. Not what we did, but what you did. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, one way we love God here at Church of the Word is how? By loving each other, right? So shake somebody's hand, tell them thank you. We're so glad that you're here at Church of the Word. If they don't like that, give them a hug. Good evening, everyone. If you could be, please be seated. Sorry, it's a little loud. Welcome to Church of the Word. Welcome to our visitors. We're glad to have you all. Um, I'll just go over the announcements. On Monday at noon, we have prayer meeting here at church, noon to one. And then Tuesday evening, we have our weekly Tuesday evening Bible study here. Good evening, everybody. That was some awesome worship. We can turn to Romans 4, 17. Hallelujah. Does anybody need an offering envelope? Raise your hand and over here there's a young man who wants to give. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory. So Romans 4.17 says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him who he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead or maketh alive the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. You have some situations in your life you can call those things that be not as though they were. In your finances, in your health, your personal lives. So then I want to go over to 1 Corinthians one twenty eight or 1 Corinthians 1. And I think I'm actually, yes, 28 is where I'm going to start. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 28, says, And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. This, this word naught came up in the prayer room, kind of fascinated me, because Jay said it. And, you know, we can use these scriptures calling the things that be not as though they were, or calling them to stop you know, in our government, and in our own lives. Because we all know that there's some things that need to be stopping in the political arena. And some things being set forth. And verse 29 says, That no flesh should glory in His presence, but of Him are you in Christ Jesus. In. You know, this word, little, little word in, it's kind of fascinating if you look it up in the Greek. Because... I don't know what the word means in, but it's a uh, position. It says it's a positional. You know, the, like the state of where you're at. You're in Christ. If you're born again and a Christian, you're in Christ. You're seated in heavenly places. It says, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. So God did did this. He sent Jesus who made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So there's other scriptures that talk about that we have the mind of Christ. And we get that because we're in Christ through what God did. And then righteousness, we're righteous. And then I have, there's another scripture, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, talks about. Second Corinthians 5, the last verse, 21, says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You have been made the righteousness. If you're born again, you're righteous. Even if you don't feel it or see it. Like the song we've been singing. 
What stuck out to me in that song about the blood is rewriting your history. And what I see in that is that what has been in the past doesn't dictate your future. It isn't your history. And when you become born again, yes, you maybe made that confession now, but you've actually been born again 2,000 years ago. That's your history. Is in Jesus. Glory. And it says he's... How's it going? It says it's rewriting your history and creating a destiny. You have a destiny in Christ. And it says, and sanctification, redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Through this, we can glory in the Lord. That's why we glory. That's why we praise the Lord is because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. He has made us righteous and sanctified and redeemed. Hallelujah. I also want to go to John 15. We're talking as kind of a, we're talking about in Him. We're in Him. So John 15, Jesus is talking about, gives a picture of this. John 15. I'm just going to read these verses here. Starting one, Jesus is saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. I found this comes around again, that calling those things that be not as, were, as though they were. Well, if I don't get tongue-tied. But, and this goes along with Mark 11. As when you believe, pray. When you say believing, you shall have them. That's what I want to encourage you all with tonight. So, Curtis, you want to pass the offering basket? Thank you, Father. So, as he's passing that, we'd like to get up, offer our uh, offerings to the Lord, you know, worship. So, Father, I thank you. We glorify you tonight, Father. We bring our offerings and our tithes to you, Lord. Thank you, Father. As your scripture says, we call those things that be not. Father, I just call those things, I like debt. I just call debt paid. Thank you, Father. Relationships restored, Father. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Earlier today, uh, Lee wasn't even in the uh, LTS classes, but he started saying some of the same things. But we had a great time in LTS about spirit, soul, and body and the difference between the three. And I believe it's one of the most crucial teachings that we need to understand as Christians is the difference because you need to know and understand when you come to verses in Scripture what he's talking about. And this is the questions that you ask. Is this a body verse? Is this a soul verse or is this a spirit verse, right? And anyway, Ron, Brother Ron was teaching us about um, how um, we're perfect in our spirit, right? We're perfect in our spirit, but yet there's things in our soul we're still working unto perfection, and there's things in our body, but we have to believe we've been made perfect by Jesus. So it works by faith, right? The just shall live, how? By faith. by faith, right? The just shall live by faith. So anyway, just good stuff. Thank you, worship team. Um, I wanted, we're not dismissing children tonight, is that correct?
I, I did want to just uh, discuss that a little bit. So uh, we are um, we're going to have uh, a children's service, and we, there's a couple of moving parts that are happening. But we're going to uh, start up the zero to four group, and then we're also anticipating here in the near future, maybe by the beginning of the year or shortly after, that we start uh, class number two. Well, there's a couple things that need to happen. First, the room needs to be f finished upstairs, right? And uh, so the room needs to be finished, and uh, a couple things have to happen uh, to get that in place. And um, thank you, Jesus. But it's coming, right? It's coming. Well, tonight, you just turn me down just a little bit. It seems to be echoing in my ears. <laughs> Thank you. Um, tonight, we're gonna we're gonna talk about. Uh, is it okay to to look at the Word tonight? Is everybody okay with that? Is it okay to open your Bible tonight? Is it okay to lay eyes on Scripture and and get some illumination right for all the. Uh, I remember being at a family reunion, and, and uh, I happened to say that we get revelation, and dear Lord, that was the wrong word to use. You don't get any more revelation than has already been given. You only get illumination. So if I say revelation instead of illumination tonight, forgive me, right? So um, if I say something that maybe you don't agree with tonight, aren't you glad, or at least I am, that the Word says you still have to love me? <laughs> right? The Word commands it. You may not like what I say, but you've got to love me. Right? And uh, thank you, Jesus. Well, tonight, uh, I believe that a lot of us are on the same page, but I want to just get our eyes on Scripture, go back to some basics, because I believe we live in a time right now, uh, it matters what you believe. How many think it matters what you believe? And... Uh, you know, it's time that we grow in that. It, it, you know, there was a time probably back in the 90s for me where I just coasted through life and life just happened and I was oblivious of most things happening in the world. Like I just didn't understand or didn't even know. But as we get into this uh, century, I believe each year that goes by, it matters where we stand, what we believe in, who we hang out with, and by faith, how we live. See, God's never changed. The just shall live by faith. See, it takes faith to live. Now, a lot of times we don't have the correct understanding of faith. Faith isn't our culture. Faith is believing. Uh, Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it tells us that it's believing in things we don't see. How many, know, how, how many have faith that there is a heaven? Right? Aren't you glad there's a heaven? Can you see it? No, not really, but you have faith. Sometimes we may get glimpses into the past or into the future. Sometimes we may have, uh, you know, you have stories of people on their deathbed and they looked up and they rejoiced, right? Because they began to see something, right? And it strengthens and bolsters our faith. But what I'm talking about tonight is really faith in the Word. Because we have to go back to Scripture and say, sometimes our circumstances, some things are happening in life that it's trying to tell us and dictate who we are and what we believe in. And we got to go back and say, you know, this might be happening in my life, but just because it happened to aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so, maybe the song said, what does the Word say? Can we agree on that? What does the Word say? And uh, one of the things that has swept our country over the last two years is, is um, fear and and, and things about a disease. And, and it's one of those things that uh, caught a lot of the church by surprise on what to do and how to deal with it. And I, I don't think that the enemy, um, if the enemy sees uh, an opening, he's going to take it all, right? And, and it wouldn't surprise me, I'm not trying to speak death upon us, but it wouldn't surprise me that he'd try it again. So it's going to matter how we handle it and what we believe. So I want to go to some basic things on healing tonight and why I believe in healing and why it's for us today and, and why that I can fasten my faith on the Word of God and it makes a difference in my life. Would you like to know that? 
Anybody want to know why I believe in healing? Well, let's turn to Isaiah. Let's go to the book of Isaiah and on the 53rd floor and the 4th and 5th room. Sometimes you got to just say it different that way people catch on, right? Maybe I told you to go to the elevator. Yeah, the elevator worked. It was the right one. Isaiah 53, right? And uh, Isaiah 53 is um, a powerful, powerful chapter. And uh, the very first verse just just is, is we, we're going to have to understand and know what report we're going to believe in. Who hath believed our report, it says. What report are you going to invest in? What in report are you going to believe in? What report are you going to take time to, to take in and believe? Because, you know, uh, as, as much as we want to believe that we're sanctified Christians, um, if, if I do some physical things to you, 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 I could probably stir up some things in Marlon. Now, Marlon's a pretty hard, t- uh, tough cookie to crack, but eventually I'd probably get through and depending what I did, and he, and, and, and he would... There's a report talking to him, right? And either he removes himself from my presence, or um, he gets upset and says, you know, pastors shouldn't act like that, right? <laughs> and I hope that's what he would do. But there's reports that are going to be talking to you in the coming months, years, the rest of your life. And you're going to have to decide what report you're going to believe. I mean, there's so much information out there out there now. If you want to go down the COVID trail, and yeah, I'll talk about that. I mean, you got this highly trained doctor saying one thing, and another highly trained doctor completely on the other side saying the other thing. So whose report are you going to believe? Right? And so I'm choosing to believe the report of the Lord. Because the report of the Lord, I believe, is something that um, I can believe by faith. Whether what I see happening in the natural or not, I'm going to believe it by faith. So uh, let's, let's just go down to... Uh, let's just read this. It's good to read this. Is it okay if we read this? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant. Now, you're going to begin to understand that this is talking about Jesus. If you do a little study on the arm of the Lord... The arm of the Lord actually represents Jesus in various different Scriptures. Well, He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. He is despised and rejected by men. How many know Jesus was despised and rejected by His own family, His own brothers? You know, when he had his coming out party, he got up at the synagogue and he got up in Luke chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 4, to read. And that was his coming out party. And he turns where, and he finds the, uh, the, the words in the book of Isaiah in the scroll. And he begins to tell them that this is now being fulfilled in your ears. I am Jesus. And they were offended. They're going, well, isn't this the guy we grew up with? I mean, we... Uh, you know, contrary to what some people believe, Jesus wasn't running around healing little broken bones on birds and animals and things like that. He actually had to come into a place of understanding. He grew in, in uh, we have scripture that says that he grew in his understanding. He grew in wisdom. So that means he didn't have it all. Right? And he had to come and find places and he had to find the scripture, what he found that day in the synagogue. And he had to get illumination and revelation, right? That that is me. And then he gets up in the synagogue and he begins to proclaim who he is. And he had to do that by faith, right? So this is Jesus being despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse 4, surely He has borne our griefs. How many uh, translations do we have here that say griefs? you got quite a few translations that say griefs. Well, if you look up this word in the Hebrew, it actually means sickness and disease. So He has surely He has borne our 
sickness and disease. This is why I believe Jesus bore sickness and disease on the cross for me. Now, I, I, we can argue all night on, on what English words should have been used to describe the Hebrew word. And they actually had a great argument when they were translating the word, translating the Bible, uh, uh, the King James especially. That translation, they actually had group discussions about this on what English word we're going to use. And in fact, it shocked them so much on what it meant that they were afraid to use it. And that's documented. You can go back and read about that. So they have, so they decided they're going to use, well, it can't be that, that good, right? And so they used the word, decided to use the word griefs. And he carried our sorrows. Now, the word sorrows means pain and affliction. So Jesus is going to carry our pains and affliction. Now, you're like, well, Jay, I don't know if I believe you. That's okay. You're allowed to not believe me, but I'm going to prove it to you in the English. How many want it proved in the English? You want it proved in the English? Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. See, at some point, even the translators couldn't keep back what was amazing. <laughs> right? Go to Matthew 8, chapter 7, chapter 8, verse 17. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. Now, verse 14. Um, how many know that Jesus loves mother-in-laws? How many also know that you know why Peter denied Jesus three times? Without being sacrilegious here, uh, well, Jesus healed his mother-in-law, so Peter had to. Apparently, Peter took that to heart, right? <laughs> Sometimes humor, injecting a little humor gets you to loosen up a little bit and receive more from heaven. Amen? Is that okay? not sure Peggy thought that was funny. but Anyway, here in verse 14, Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. Now verse 16 says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he casts out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick. Somebody say, all who were sick. Now there was a specific reason He healed in this particular time. Why? Verse 17 says, "...that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses." See, right there, the translators could no longer get away and they finally just put it in plain English instead of trying to hide it behind griefs and sorrows and it makes it a little muddled on what it actually means. Now they put it in plain English that He did this to prove that He was here to heal and to come bring that to pass. So if that... Now let's go back to Isaiah because now we, we, we just made sure that we understand that it was sicknesses and diseases. I choose to believe the Word. Now, I know all of us have stories. I had a brother that passed away at a young age from cancer. Some of you have uh, siblings and people you know. Some of you may know somebody right now that's on their deathbed. But you know, and, and it's like, well, we were believing God for healing. Well, one thing I want to always come back to, I am not going to base my theology on Aunt Margaret and Uncle Joe. I'm just being real. I'm going to, face, I'm going to base my theology on what the Word says. Because what the Word says trumps. Anybody ever play Rook? You know what trump is? It's the, it's the color uh, that somebody just says, well, this color is Trump, right? So it trumps what our circumstances tell us. And, 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 and I'm, it's not that it's um, easy to go through some of those things. It may be very painful. But how many know that Jesus came to even help with that? See, we have the hope of glory in us, right? 
And see, the sting of death has been taken away for us, which is why we can stand at the grave and say, oh, you know, the, this person died too young. It wasn't right. Something was wrong. They shouldn't have died, but at least they went to heaven. You know, a lot of times uh, we need to check ourselves in that area because we want and we spend all of our life trying to get people to go to heaven and then we cry and carry on when they do. I mean, we, we, we need to check ourselves a little bit because you know what? That's a glorious place. And if we believe the Word on what it is, we wouldn't be so sorrowful. Now, I'm not saying we don't have any sorrow and grief. We do. However, Jesus came to help with that. Right? Jesus can take care of that. And yes, what, part of the reason that we sometimes sorrow longer than, uh, than maybe we should or normal is because we know what's been robbed. Right? We know we've been robbed. We know the person's been robbed of life. And so it breaks our heart that they were robbed of their life. And they did die too quickly. However, Jesus is the fixer. Jesus is the one that puts us all back together again. Jesus gives us the hope and the faith that we can continue to walk in Him and believe the Word because there's going to come a day. Now, I know this may be hard to believe, but we're all going to be in heaven. We're all going to be, I believe we're going to know each other, right? I believe we're going to recognize each other. I believe we're going to, uh, we're going to be in His kingdom, right? And we're going to talk about uh, the, the shortest thing we ever did in life. And that was live on earth. It's the shortest thing we'll ever do. If you have eternal life, then your earth life will be the shortest thing you'll ever do compared to eternity. It's just like a, it's like a pencil mark. And you're going to scratch your head and go, boy, I really got caught up in a lot of stuff on earth that I probably shouldn't have got caught up with. If I'd have just had an eternal mindset and understood things with an eternal view, I would have got out of my mess a little quicker. <laughs> right? But sometimes, you know, our pity parties, we really enjoy them and we invite everybody and nobody comes. And, 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 then, and then we have more of a pity party, right? Anybody ever have a pity party and you invited everybody and nobody showed up? And, and then you feel really sorry for yourself. And, 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 you, and that's just a ploy of the enemy to rob you of life and to rob you of your faith. Right? So here in Isaiah, let's keep reading here. Isaiah 53. And then we're going we're gonna to answer some questions. We're going to ask some of the hard ones. Surely He has borne our diseases and sickness. He has carried our pains and afflictions. Aren't you glad that He's carried your pains and afflictions? Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. How many know that He bore the, the weight of the world on His shoulders? Not just your sin, but everybody's sin. In fact, Scripture actually tells us that Jesus was made sin. He had to be, He was the sacrifice. You can't sacrifice God. I mean, no, you can't sacrifice God. So he actually had to be made something. And then he also had to bear the penalty, right? The penalty had to be borne by Jesus, which means he went to hell. And we have scripture that talk about him being in hell. It says he plundered it. I mean, this is later, right? But first, before that could happen, he had to bear the consequence. See, if there was no consequence, if He did not bear your consequence, then you still have to bear it. If Jesus didn't bear the consequence of our sin, then we still have to bear it. 
because it wouldn't have been paid. So if he paid it in full, then he had to bear the consequence. You know, we get that as parents. I mean, boy, wouldn't that have been cool if that would have worked with mom when I was growing up. Oh, I have, and she's telling me, they're the consequence for your actions. Oh, well, my brother paid for it. Right? And I shift it over on him. And then she, then she goes over to him and says, well, now you have to bear the consequence. And somewhere along the line, no consequence is ever done. We're not going to believe mom next time. Right? If she gives in to that, and she would have believed that. We know that, to be fair, consequence the consequence of our sin had to be dealt with, and, it, and the only person qualified was Jesus. He was the only one qualified. And He had to take our sin, and not only take our sin, but was made sin, so that we can have life, and life more abundantly. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it talks, let's just turn there really quickly. John chapter 10. Verse 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. Anybody have anything stolen from them in life? Maybe, I mean, not necessarily physical things per se, but what if your happiness was stolen? What if your joy was robbed? Right? See, the thief comes not. In other words, it's King James English for saying he doesn't come except for one reason. The thief is going to steal, kill, and destroy. Period. I have come, Jesus talking, that they, who's the they? Say, that's me. That they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In other words, I like how the, uh, how the Amplified says it. Amplifies it, right? It's to the f- overflow. That they can have life till it flows over. You ought to have so much life in you that you got overflow. And people aren't looking at you as sad Christians, but they're going, how can you be so happy because you got an abundant overflow of life happening in you? That's what's happening. Now, Jesus didn't come. We don't read here that He came to bring us sickness and disease, do we? The thief comes to steal kill, and destroy. And if Jesus is telling me that He just brings life and life more abundantly, then I'm believing it's life. I believe it's Zoe life. That's what it is. Not See, we, we go to church to learn things that the world already knows. You can walk down the streets of of Delta, and you you can grab an unbeliever, somebody that's not born again, and ask him a question and say, is cancer good or bad? And he says it's bad. And then you go to church and find out that somehow it was good for you. No, it's bad. It's always been bad. Always will be bad. It's of the devil. How many know, I, I shared this Tuesday night, that when it talks about when Jesus... I shared this Tuesday night that the first Adam, sickness and disease came with the first Adam, right? When he fell. Then why would we say that the second Adam does not cancel out, or we actually, the last Adam, the last Adam is who? Jesus. Why would we say the last Adam does not 100% cancel out everything the first Adam brought? Is my Jesus not that powerful? That the last Adam, Jesus, would absolutely erase and cancel everything the first Adam brought. There wasn't sickness and disease in the garden. When God created the earth, He said it was good. Right? He said it was good. And when God says it was good, it was good. So now, let's go look. And I, I want to I look at some uh, hard things because some of you are probably thinking, going, yeah, well, what about? So let's go look at it. Is that okay? How many know that if I want to present truth, I'm not afraid of the hard verses. Now, I might not have the answer for you. Is that okay? If Pastor Jay doesn't have all your answers, are you going to fall apart? No? Okay. Thank you. <sighs> Glad that's off my chest because I'd sure hate for you to fall apart because of me. 
right? You should have your eyes on Jesus, not on me. And I may not have all your answers. I, you may have a question I can't answer. But I'm here to tell you that I'm choosing faith in the character of God tonight. And it's been His character from the very beginning to produce a good creation and then put man that was created in His likeness and in His image and put it right into the middle of that good creation. It was the crown jewel of the, of the entire thing that was happening. And He made man on the very sixth day at the very end when everything was complete and when everything was done. And the next day, the first thing man does was rested in what God did. He rests and goes, Wow, Lord, you're amazing. His first, his eyes opened. He, the Lord breathed into them, into him, and he became a living soul, a living spirit. And he opens his eyes, and he just looks around in amazement and go, and he goes, "Daddy, you did that for me. Wow, this is amazing." Right? That's the relationship God still desires with you. That's the relationship He still wants with us. When you wake up in the morning, you, you look around in amazement at what the Lord has done in your life. And when the goodness of God leads you to repentance, which is scriptural, because in Romans chapter 4, verse 2, it's not the wrath of God that leads us to repentance. It's not hell that leads us to repentance. He is so absolutely good and merciful and grace and graces us that that leads us to repentance. In other words, God is so good and you go, Lord, you're so good to me today. And He goes, yeah, I know. You want some more? That leads us to repentance because we're going, I am undone. I don't deserve what you're giving me. So I am nothing and I'm going to put everything I got in You. And I'm just going to believe You, Lord, because everything You have is amazing for me. And Your plan for me is awesome and great. And I'm going to follow You and Your will because the enemy has lied and lied and lied and lied in that if you actually become too much of a Christian, if you actually serve Him too much, then you're going to have to do things you don't want to do. And it's exactly the opposite. The more you press in, the more you serve Him, the more you realize His goodness for you, the more you realize how amazing and how good He actually is for you, the more you actually desire and want to serve Him. And then you start realizing that His plans for you are to prosper. His plans are for you to be in victory. I have yet to find the person that actually does what they say they believe uh, in the negative. Let me qualify that. You know, when we go into business, I'm part of lots of Facebook business groups. I enjoy business. There's a calling and anointing on me to be in business. And um, I have yet to find people that will follow a failed business coach. Now maybe you can point them out to me, but I haven't found them yet. And you got Facebook groups of thousands of members following people and men because of their success. Not because they failed. Right? Uh, it's a little like the story uh, um, uh, Dale talks about. Uh, Dale and Bob are driving in the car having a great old time worshiping Jesus. And uh, Dale says it happened so quickly. They just sat and laughed and laughed and laughed. But there's this, they come up to a red light and they're ready to turn right. And uh, apparently on that street, they have parked cars, that the parking spots coming up to the red light. And Dale, thinking it's just a line of turning right, he just whips right behind a whole row of parked cars and parks, thinking it's going to turn right. And all of a sudden they realize, uh, this is parked cars. Nothing's moving. <laughs> and, and so they, they laugh, but he uses it for an illustration. It's a great illustration because nobody follows parked cars. 
I haven't found the person yet trying to follow a parked car. I haven't yet found the business person that wants success in his business that follows an unsuccessful man. So we get it there, and then we come into the church, and then we got to rearrange our thinking, and we follow people that aren't healed. Now, I'm going to follow people that are. And I'm going to believe by faith the Word. And I'm going to believe that over any book that was written or any song that was sung. Because I'm going to believe it by faith. I first have to, believe, I have to before I can even attach faith to it. And this is really what I want to drive at. You have to get settled. You cannot be in faith for anything. Anything. You cannot be in faith for anything unless you're absolutely sure it is God's will. Now, let's, let's just backtrack. Let's think this through with salvation. Because with you getting saved, when I got saved, I had to come to a realization. When you got saved, were you wishy-washy on whether it was God's will for you to get saved? I was pretty sure one foot was in hell for me. I was really sure God wanted me saved. The problem for me was I wasn't sure I wanted to commit to it. But I was convinced God wanted me saved. Right? So how many here weren't convinced? They weren't sure. See, you, you may have been that at some point, but at some point in your life, you had to come to a place that you were convinced God wanted you saved. Now you can release faith for it. Because when you got saved, did you get teleported to heaven? No. All you did was maybe you um, recited a prayer. Somebody else got you to pray. Right? And when you did that, maybe for you the lights went on and it went shazam and all kinds of, and you got goosebumps and got goosebumps on your goosebumps. But at least for the rest of us, nothing really happened that much other than I believed. And when you get to a place of believing, you had to come from a place of you know it was God's will. So when you finally figured out that God wanted you saved and set free, then you attach your faith to that and boom, you're saved. Now you may not have necessarily felt that great. Some maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I know people that didn't. I, I know for myself, the next morning I felt, I mean, the, the sky was uh, sunnier and the grass was greener. And, and I mean, whew, wow, the world was amazing. It was awesome. And, and there was a difference. Right? But it wasn't until the next morning until that happened. It wasn't exactly when I when when I believed, right? So sometimes we have those experiences, but even if I don't have that experience, I need to go back to I believe what the word says and I believe it by faith. Okay? So now I'm believing what the word says about me, and I know that what the word says is his will for me. And when I understand that it is His will for me, now I can use faith to believe. Because I may not see it in action, but I don't have to because the Word says. So now I go back. Sometimes I have symptoms on my body. I'm not here saying I'm never sick. I'm not here saying you'll never be sick. What I am saying, I can encourage you that God wants you well. And if He wants you well, then by faith, you can attach to what He wants and now you can get out of your sickness, right? And three years later, you take less and less pills. In fact, Marlon forgets to take his pills. Because he feels so good and he forgets to take them doesn't mean that they're bad form necessarily. It just means that he forgot because he's putting faith in the Word of God. See, I'm not against, I'm not against the doctor. I'm not against the hospital. I'm not against taking things for the health of your body. But what, when you do those things, you actually reveal that you want to get better. Don't you? So if you want to get better, 
I'm like, go for it. Get better. See, we got to honor, but we need to know we cannot just take what happens with God's will um, when the doctor no longer has an answer. How many know doctors have been wrong? I mean, if the last two years haven't taught you that scientists, science, doctors can be dead wrong, then I don't know what planet you're living on. I mean, they used to call science and they used to bleed people to death. (laughs) That was their science of the day. Science has constantly moved. The fence posts have always moved and everybody that's ever been alive has always thought they lived in the latest, greatest science there ever was. And they have all the answers. I'm here to tell you they don't. I'm here to tell you the doctors don't have all the answers. There's some things they can, they're really good at, they can help you with, and I'm thankful for. But my faith is not going to be in a humanistic human doctor. It's going to be in God first. So if I understand that God wants me healed, I'll happily go to the doctor. I'll happily, if there's things that He can fix that I believe that I'm to do, I'm fine with going there, but I'm not going to wait to pray. Now hear me on this. I'm not going to wait to pray and believe God till after the doctor sends me home. I'm going to pray and believe God before I go while I'm there, and when I'm home. But a lot of people just, well, if the doctor can't fix me, well then that must be God's sign that He doesn't want me well. And that is just a lie from the pit of hell. That is just a lie from the enemy because I just showed you Scripture that Jesus died on the cross for your, and He carried sickness and disease. And I'm not going to go into that anymore, but I do want to go to Paul's thorn in the flesh. Do I have time for that? It's only 8 o'clock. How many want to hear about Paul's thorn? I want to ask you a question before we go there. Where's your faith? Most people have more faith in Job's boils, Paul's thorn, and Timothy's stomach sickness than they do in Jesus' stripes. So which one are you? Are you going to have more faith? <laughs> it's true. Because every time you bring up the subject of healing, they're like, yeah, but Job. And then you talk to somebody else, they're like, yeah, but Paul. Well, what about Timothy? And you're like, okay, so do you have more faith in their circumstances than the Word? Are you going to have put more faith in that than what the Bible says? How many know that, and I don't have time to go into all of them, I'm not going to go to all of them, I'd be here for at least another hour, which would probably be good. But uh, Job, just real quickly, Job repented at the end of the book, he repented for his view of God. And And he says he didn't understand it. Right? So right there's your answer. He didn't have a correct view. He didn't understand it. He didn't even really know that there was a devil. See, you got to understand that we read the book of Job afterwards and we're like, ah, it was clear as the nose on your face. Right here it is. But Job going through it, he didn't really know. And he had to learn these things. He didn't have Scripture, by the way. He didn't have the Word. He didn't, he didn't, have, he didn't go back and strengthen himself in the Word and all the promises of God and read all the promises and say yes and amen. They're all yes and amen for me. Job didn't have that. You have something he didn't have. Right? You're aware there's an enemy, number one. Number two, and, and Job thought God did it. He was convinced God did it for him, to him. And then later, and that's why I'm saying at the end, he repented for his view. Right? I'll let you go research that and read it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So which one are you? You have more faith in the stripes of Jesus or in Job's boils? You have more faith in the stripes of Jesus or at Paul's thorn? I, I, I choose, I'm going to have faith in his stripes. I, I'm going to have faith that by his stripes, 
I am healed. I was healed 2,000 years ago. I am healed now. And I, and I, and I can live healed. Right? In other words, uh, 3 John 2 says, I wish that you all prosper and be in health. See, even as or the, to the degree of what's happening in your soul. Today we learn in LTS class that your soul is your mind, your will, and emotions. And what affects your emotions your, is really your mind. And you can have sickness of the mind, right? And the only way to get healing for those things is to get your mind renewed. In other words, you're going to stop thinking. I, I just read this this last week that in any given day, on a normal person, this is scientific studies now, if you believe it, <laughs> uh, they have 80,000 thoughts. So on any given day, you will have about 80,000 thoughts. Now, I don't know who counted it. Don't ask me. That is just what I read. 80,000 thoughts. 60,000 are negative. See, you need help before you even start. Right? Right? 60,000 of your thoughts are negative. And I'm, I'm expecting if you're extremely negative, maybe it's 70,000, maybe it's 75, maybe it's 79,999 for you, right? And you got one positive thought on a given day. And the only way you're going to fix that is to think different. Proverbs says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So the, the way you think matters. Now, a lot of people will go around and say, well, I can't help my thought life. I can't help what I'm thinking. I'll tell you, you can. And if you grab a hold of Scripture and begin to meditate and read and allow that to roll through your mind, you will think things according to Scripture. So uh, let's just do a little um, fun activity. So I got a big pink elephant over here. Did everybody see it? It's sitting down. It's, got a, it's like Dumbo. It has big floppy ears and it's pink. And it's... And it's sitting there with its front legs like this, right? It's right here. You all see it? And now count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many sort of forgot about the elephant? See, while you were counting, you kind of forgot. Now it might have been a little bit there, but it, it was less, right? See, the same thing happens when you have negative th thoughts bombarding your mind. You begin to renew your mind on the Word and you get into the Word and understand what His thoughts are. Those things become less. And as they become less, the Word becomes stronger in your life. And you'll figure out one day, wow, God does want me healed. I mean, His name is Jehovah Rapha. That's his name. I don't know if you know what Rafa means. Anybody here know what Rafa means? Healer. So why would the name of God be Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, the healer, or like he told the children of Israel, I am the Lord that heals you. Right? And he also said, I send my word to heal you. And in Psalms 103, there's benefits. Last time I checked, there's benefits to serving God because He heals all my sicknesses and diseases and He takes care of all my iniquities. See, all of these things, we got to get that churning in on the inside of you and you'll begin to think different and you'll begin to act more healed because your soul is prospering. Your soul is realizing what it needs to know so that you can have the illumination and the revelation that you need. So let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, Jay, how are you going to get yourself out of this one? Let's, let's look at the first word that, uh, where infirmities is used. And uh, we're going to go to chapter 12, verse 5. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. Now, if you look up this word infirmities, it means sickness. It, it means, uh, it's an old English, older English word, uh, if I can pronounce it correctly, uh, malady, or uh, is that how you said it? Or uh, malady? Malady is how you say it. I've seen it, and I wasn't sure even how to pronounce it, because I don't think we use that in everyday language anymore, do we? Right? So it's a malady, right? It, it's, it, that's what this word means. Well, there's actually two meanings to this 
to this word. One of them can mean malady, sickness, and another meaning can mean weakness. Weakness. Now, before we go any further, Scripture tells us that we're to define Scripture with what? What does Timothy tell us to do? It tells us to study, to show ourselves approved unto the Lord. But how do you do that? How do you uh, interpret Scriptures? I I talked about earlier, do you interpret Scripture with the song? No. Do you interpret Scripture by how you lived your life? I want you to think about that because a lot of people do. Not necessarily, maybe not how you lived your life, but what happened to you in your life. They will interpret script, Scripture to what happened to them in life. How many know we live in a fallen world? How many know not, the, not everything that happens is God's will? If you don't believe me, then why have you not walked in His will? Oops. Have you ever not walked in His will? Well, I thought it's automatic that everything that happens is the Lord's will. It's not. You can walk outside of His will. Do you believe that? Is everybody with me on that? You can walk outside of His will. So that means if you can walk outside of His will, not everything that is happening in your life is the will of God, is it? No, it's not. Is sin the will of God? No. Did God want Adam to sin? Did He want you to sin? No, He actually gives you specific instruction to not participate because it has a wage. There's wages to sin and it kills you. So He says, don't do this. Don't do that. Because it'll hurt you. Right? Thank God we're forgiven. But sin will hurt us if we continue to do it. Right? So we establish now that there's some things that happen that are not God's will. So do you think maybe some more things could happen that might not be God's will? Do you think anybody ever died early? See, it's interesting to me how people will say, oh wow, he he died early, he went before his time, but it was the Lord's will. Well, hang on. No, those two things don't go together. You can't die early Right? See, if it's the Lord, we have scripture that talks about that, that we are promised long life. We have scripture that tells, tell us, honor your father and mother and with long life. Right? So now you can, I believe that we can live according to our faith to a certain extent. There is a time to die. I've gotten accused. Well, Jay, you just believe you're going to live forever. And I look at him and I say, yes, I have eternal life and I will live forever and ever and ever. <laughs> well, that sort of makes them mad and angry. So um, I've learned to use my discretion on when I say that. But yeah, I, I am going to live forever. Okay, You don't think you're going to live forever? No, in this body, this body will die. But I believe that we can live out our days and fulfill the work that God has for us for this kingdom. Right? That's what we're here for. We're here to advance the kingdom of God. So back to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 6, For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, it's going to tell you what the thorn is right here. Let, let, let's just... Do we all read English? It's not Russian, right? So, so we can all understand this. So, so here's the thorn. It's not blindness. It's not pus oozing out of the eyes. Like I mean, you can find all kinds of people on YouTube. I mean, yeah, pus running out of the eyes. It's, it's, it, that's why he wrote the letter, this large letter that I write to you, because he had a, 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 
Uh, he had a sickness of the eyes, and, and so pus was uh, running out of this, and all these things. That was his thorn. No, it tells us what the thorn is. It's really easy to read. It's so simple that uh, one of these young uh, children here can understand it. It says, A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. That's your thorn. The messenger of Satan buffeted him. And all we have to do is back up in chapter 11 and read about the buffets. Right? And what does it say in chapter 11? Verse 22 talks about he's a Hebrew, but he's a fool for Christ. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Now, did Paul die? Well, what does he mean in death often? You ever wonder? So what, was this guy raised from the dead several times? What's, what's going on? I believe he was. I believe one of the times is when he was stoned. And they left him for dead. Last I checked, when they stone people, they're not chucking at your toes. They're chucking at your head. They want you to die. They're trying to kill you. right? And he was left for dead. It says the disciples came up and he got up with them, I believe that there was prayer, there was resurrection from the dead, and they, he got up and he was preaching shortly thereafter in the next city. And oh, by the way, then he writes, I believe it's to the Galatians, then he uh, writes to them and says, when you first seen me in my weakness. Well, yeah, I just got stoned. How weak would you be when you get stoned? Right? He's still recovering. There was a recovery time for him. you know he Paul was flesh and blood he was not Jesus God used him to write the New Testament a lot of it but he was flesh and blood in other words he probably had black and blue marks I mean sometimes we have this elevated view of Paul that he couldn't have possibly thought wrong and we're going to look at what he was thinking and it was wrong but he got some revelation. He got some illumination. Right? He, he, was, he wasn't God, was he? He was a human being. Paul, can, so in other words, if Paul is a human being, can Paul miss it? Can you miss it? So if you can miss it, then Paul can miss it. See, we have a lot of things that he did that he did right. But I'm here to tell you, he wasn't perfect. There was only one perfect person. That was Jesus. And after Paul got um, um, spirit-filled and began to serve the church, he also had some failures. And we got to stop acting like he never failed. There were some things he had to work through, and here's one of them. So let's, uh, uh, let's, keep, let's keep reading. Let's go back to chapter 12. So he got the messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, I want you to just to think a little bit. Who exalts us? The Lord. So what does Satan hate? See, we write, read this in the context of, 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 of he exalting him. I don't believe that's what it is. I believe the, he, the, uh, the Satan seeing that the Lord is going to exalt Paul. And so he sent a messenger of Satan to buffet him to keep him from being exalted. Okay? So, this messenger of Satan, which we actually have Scripture, if you talk, remember the, the girl that followed Paul and was it Silas? And, and followed crying out and, and Paul didn't know what to do with this crazy lady and he has this crazy lady following him for three days and then he ends up, finally he got revelation on what to do. He casts the Spirit out of her. Now he has the whole town angry because she would foretell the future and they made money that way. So now she was a slave, made her owners angry. They get cast into, into um, um, prison because of it. Because he, uh, uh, he ended up getting the revelation on what to do in that situation, but that didn't mean Satan stopped buffeting him. Buffeting him. Everywhere he went, there was revival or they were kicking him out of the town, right? So the messenger of Satan kept, this angel kept following him around and try, was trying to keep him from doing what he was supposed to do. 
So now, verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And this is where people get the hang up. So Paul, he's a human being. He, so where was I? So he pleaded, uh, I, I didn't remember where I was. So concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I've prayed three times over something. I've prayed multiple times for something to happen in my life. I have, Paul got in to, he got out of faith. How many know that the prayer of faith believes that they receive? How many know that? How many know that the prayer of faith believes that you receive? So once you ask the Lord, now what do you do? You thank the Lord for the answer. Because the prayer of faith believes that you have now received it. See, you can't... Taylor is going to pray for my Bible. Okay? So, you, dear Jay, I pray, <laughs> I pray for, for my Bible, right? And I'm going to, so, so you're praying for my Bible, right? So at what point does she get her Bible? See, this is really what a lot of people think God's going to do. They think God is going to place the Bible in her lap. Now, play this with me. You know what you're supposed to do? So if she's praying for my Bible, what's she going to do? At some point, she's going to have to receive what she was praying for and take what's hers. See, the Lord wants us to take what's ours by faith. Thank you, Taylor. By faith, we have to take what's ours. So Paul here is out of faith. See, that, 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 I know that's warping your minds a little bit because you've probably been taught that, well, Paul wrote all of the New Testament. He can't possibly have done something wrong. But Paul is a flesh and bone human being. He's not always, he didn't live in perfection, right? And so now the Lord tells him, so he gets. Uh, verse 9, and he said to me, the Lord speaking to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, this is the only place that Christianity teaches that when something is sufficient for you, you got to put up with it. Are you with me? So if I have, let's say you have this big pile of dirt in your backyard. Picture this. You got a big pile of dirt in your backyard? and you really want it to be moved, and you've been really bugged about this, you're annoyed, uh, maybe it was your husband that put it there, and he's not listening to you, wives, or, or, or whatever happened. And uh, so you really want it moved, and I, and I come up to you and I say, Marlon, you know, you got that big pile of dirt, but don't worry, I got a truck. It's sufficient to move it. Okay? I just told Marlon that I have a vehicle that's sufficient to move the pile of dirt, right? Marlon walks away going, oh, I just got to put up with this pile of dirt. Oh, dear Lord, I don't know what to do with this pile of dirt. This pile of dirt, I wish it would leave. And I, Jay said his truck's sufficient, but I just got to put up with this, and I just guess it's just my cross to bear. No, he doesn't. He goes, he, he scratches his head, and uh, the little hair he has left there, and he goes, man, Jay's going to come and move the dirt. Right? When God says, my grace is sufficient, that doesn't mean you put up with it. It means it's sufficient to remove it. So you're here rejoicing. That's why he says the next couple verses. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, when you have a weakness, your infirmities, there's weaknesses in your, in, in your life, that's when He's made strong because it no longer is you. See, Marlon can't go bragging to his wife how he moved the dirt. He has to let me get the glory, right? <laughs> the same way, we don't get the glory for what we do in our lives. He gets the glory. So when you're weak, let the weak say, I am strong. So when you get to say you're strong, God gets the glory in your weakness. 
Now let's keep reading. It just keeps making more and more sense. Therefore, most gladly I will boast in my infirmities, see, weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, you come across a challenge in your life, you start dancing. You're like, yeah, well, I can't move it. That's right, you can't. Glad you figured that out. you got to get over to the power of God in your life, and now you're going to glory when you come up against something you cannot do, because when you can't do it, He can. And when He can, He gets the glory you don't, or I don't. Right? The glory is His. Because His grace is sufficient for all your needs. All of your needs are taken care of because of His sufficiency and His grace. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, you wanna, I'm going to show you one more place. If you don't believe infirmities means weaknesses, I'll show you another place that this Greek word is used. Same place. Or same way. Romans 8, verse 26. And if this doesn't make your ticker tick, then I don't know, I can't help you. Romans 8.26 Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our what? Same Greek word as infirmities in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Same Greek word. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our Weaknesses, some of your translations may say infirmities, right? Same Greek word. Aren't you glad that the Spirit is going to help you? See, it doesn't say likewise and you have to put up with your problem. No, it says the Spirit is going to help you. I'm going to believe the Word that the Spirit is going to help me. I don't have to live a put up with life. I have authority because of what Jesus did on the cross. I now have the authority and I have life and death coming out of my mouth. And there is sometimes we take a stand, take our authority, don't allow the enemy, the thief, to steal, kill, and destroy in our lives. And we have got to stop lining up, up ourselves with Paul and his thorn. I've heard way too many people, well, I'm just like Paul. Really? Read chapter 11. How many times were you beat 40 times save one? How many times were you beat by the bottom of your feet with uh, rods uh, this thick? And what when they did is they propped your feet up and they beat the bottom of your feet so you could never walk again. And that man walked all over Asia preaching the gospel. Right? Don't just be a little careful when you say, "Well, I'm just like Paul." No, you're probably not. Let's just get real. You're probably not. And I'm going to be like Paul in the way that I'm going to glory in a weakness so that I don't have to put up with it, but yeah, I get rid of it. And I get delivered. Let the weak say, stay weak. Whoops! That's not what Scripture says, does it? Let the weak say, I am strong. Even when you don't feel strong, even when you don't look strong, you're going to have faith that you are strong because what you think changes how you act. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I thank You so much for Your illumination of Your Scripture. I thank You that Your Scripture is true. And Father, I thank You for Your character. I thank You that Your name is the God who heals. And Father, I'm asking that, that there's people we know right now that um, are on their deathbeds or very close to it or not uh, maybe uh, uh, waffling between uh, what uh, should happen? Family mem members may be in in um, uh, 
uh, in confusion or family members may be not understanding who You are, Lord. But I'm here to declare Your works. I'm here to declare that Your name is Jehovah Rapha, the Healer. And Father, I pray that anybody can receive by faith Your character and understanding of Your character. In Jesus' name, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. Tell people the good news. The too good to be true good news of Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, there's when Jesus got up in the synagogue, He got up and He talked about all the things He came to do. And it's never stopped. Amen? Hallelujah. We'll see you Monday noon and Tuesday evening for Bible study. You're dismissed.